Hello, Business 630 online students. This is Professor Hassey, and this is my week number one of course lecture video. Uh, as I explained in our introduction to our course uh, over this past weekend, <clears throat> every week I will give you a minimum of two videos. One video will be uh, posted on the weekend, Saturday or Sunday, before our week's work <clears throat> to highlight the topics of the week, go over any assignments that might be coming due that week, and just discuss the overall administration of the course. And then on Monday or Tuesday, uh, I will post a lecture video of the topics of the week that you are to review and study from the textbook or the material in Blackboard. I'm a little bit late this week. Uh, today is Wednesday, June 9th. I'm a little late, uh, a little bit backed up uh, with the ending of the spring semester and commencement and a variety of things. So uh, I apologize for being a little bit late this week. But our topic this week is like the course introduction and basically going over material that probably most of you have already had in prior business finance or accounting classes. The definition of the time value of money from chapter four, the definition of what is debt financing or bond financing in chapter five and equity financing stock valuation in chapter seven. We will review the risk and return, which combines all of these in chapter six next week. You have a, an assignment due this week on Sunday, June 13th, a discussion post. Uh, also, uh, that post will be uh, it's serving as a way of me making sure you understand how to use Blackboard and also putting together a portfolio of stocks that we will track throughout our term to use as a financial analysis of the companies that you have selected throughout the term. And I will talk more about that in a, in a few minutes today. Also, we're going to have some professor meetings in the next couple of weeks. I'd like to meet with all the students individually for five or 10 minutes in the first part of an online class, just to make sure you're okay with the infrastructure, with the course layout, and if you have any concerns about our course study this summer. <clears throat> this class is Business 635, corp uh, uh, Corporate Finance. And it basically is an advanced finance class in your preparation to be a, a managed MBA degree uh, graduate. You are here in this class to learn the financing side of strategy, the financial side of managing and setting plans for a corporation. If you want to be an entrepreneur, you're going to have to do all these things to in order to attract capital. You're going to have to come up with strategies of investment return, of investment management. So this class is designed for all those purposes in your MBA program. Today I'm going to lecture of the brief the key topics out of the first three chapters of our discussion. Time value of money, debt, and stock valuation. <clears throat> Here is our uh, Blackboard site, which hopefully many of you have already reviewed and gone over. But every week I will have a uh, introduction video, as I just said, and a lecture video. Sometimes the lecture videos can be 30 minutes. Other times they could be two hours. Uh, but I tried to limit them to just to go over the key parts that you need to concentrate on in preparing for your case studies and work in this class. In week number one this week, if you go into that week, you'll see a, a the uh, under uh, in our week number one file folder, you'll see my lecture that I'm be going over in just a few minutes. And also I put in some review problems from chapters four, five, and seven. These review problems are strictly for you voluntarily to go over and look over. They have nothing to do with your grade of this course. They are just to give you some backup as to the discussions that I'll be making here in this lecture, but also, knowledge of these review problems will help you probably in our case studies when you'll be doing some of these calculations and understand the definitions that are talked about in my lecture and in the review problems. I will post the solutions to these review problems every Friday of our of our of our work week. So the problems are there for you to review. They're not there for grades or to turn in. They're just there for review purposes and to study purposes only.
Again, this PowerPoint is located in week number one, and it serves as a review of the chapters. Remember I mentioned in our introduction that the textbook is a voluntary uh, prerequisite of this course. You do not need to purchase the textbook. I will go over the key topics and provide all the information on the key topics from the textbook. But if you wanna purchase one and use it as a review guide or a research guide, please feel free. It might help some of you. I'm under the assumption that all of you have had business 500D or some type of business finance class as a prerequisite for this course, meaning you've already studied a lot of this material. I'm gonna go into the strategic basis of this material. How does it help you manage? How does it help you determine strategic positions in a company? That's the key to our course. Remember, corporate finance is the art of maximizing the value of your company through the acquiring of capital, the investing in assets to produce profits and cash flow. And it can be a big headache, as you can see by this dollar bill here. But our class is to make that uh, seem a little bit more clear to you in your business or finance studies. Corporate finance is important to management because the knowledge of capital budgeting, capital structure, and working capital provides for effective decision-making if the company is to maximize profits and stay competitive for future success. In other words, the managing of capital, money, debt, equity, cash flow. Remember, there's three legal ways companies can attract capital. Make a profit, borrow money, either short-term or long-term, and acquire investors, be it the private investors, hedge funds, venture capitalists, private investors, or public investment, selling your stock as equity in the public markets. That's how you acquire the capital through those means. The key to corporate finance is to take this capital and maximize value of the company. There's three principles involved with corporate finance. The investment principle, where you wanna earn a return over the hurdle rate that it costs you to acquire the capital. Hurdle rate could be interest rate. Hurdle rate could be an expected rate of return on a stock investment. Hurdle rate could be your expected profit margins of your company. You wanna invest in assets that acquire higher return than those cost rates. The financing decision principle. How you, have, what mix of debt and equity will you use to finance your company? That's very important. Equity is the most expensive form of finance. Debt, especially these days in 2021 are very cheap, but also they are fixed costs. You have to pay them. And that's where companies can get in trouble. It's called leverage. And then the third principle of finance is the dividend decision. How do you return and what format do you return the return to your investors? With debt, it's pretty simple. You pay the interest, you pay back the principal. In equity, it gets a little bit more complicated. You can pay dividends, cash dividends. You can pay stock dividends. You can pay, you can split your stock. You can repurchase the stock from the, from the investors. All kinds of strategies involved in dividend decision-making. One of the key areas of determining value of companies is to understand the time value of money. Remember, and you know this from your own personal financial affairs, the present value of money today is different than the future value of money. In terms of investment, the present value today hopefully is less than the future value because it'll be increasing with the return on that investment. Or also the present value of money today is less compared to a future value because of inflation. What is the definition of the time value of money and how do we use it in finance? That's the, that's the topic of chapter four. Remember, present value determines the current value. All right, the current value. And that's very important. What is the current value of my house today compared to what the potential future value could be? 
what is the present value of my investment in stock today compared to the future value of what it, what it could be? That's why you invest in your house. That's why you invest in stock because you hope the present value is going to be less than the future value. But if you take the value of that asset over time and bring it back to today's value, that's the intrinsic value. And that's very important to determine the value of companies. Remember, companies create cash flow. It's called free cash flow, and you need to be aware of the definition of free cash flow. Free cash flow is the net operating profit after taxes minus the required investments in operating capital. That equals how much cash you have available now for new projects to return to your investors. And that free cash flow is discounted over time by the cost of your money, the cost of debt, the cost of equity. And that discount determines the present value of your business. Taking all the money you anticipate making in free cash flow out into the future and discounting it back to today's value at whatever that money is costing you to acquire. That's the present value concept. And the free cash flow, as I just said, is, is the amount of cash available from operations for distribution to all investors to pay interest on debt, to pay back principal, to pay dividends, to buy back stock, to invest in new assets. Free cash flow can, is the amount of money you have available for that. One of the key investment drivers of Warren Buffett, I'm sure you've heard of him, is to locate companies that are valued low but have high free cash flow. Because that means they're gonna be valued a lot greater down the road. And basically those companies are cheap. So he buys them because he knows that free cash flow will turn into a greater return over time. That's the free cash flow position of a company, a very important concept in corporate finance. Remember the determination that we saw as determining the discount rate of future cash flows is what is our cost of money? And I'm sure a lot of you studied this in business finance. The weighted average cost of equity and cost of debt, those combinations are the weighted average cost of capital. That determines the value of your company by the discount of the free cash flow over time, the cost of money. Another key topic is where is this money coming from to determine this present value? Remember the present value is the present value today, the present value in the future, the present value of cash flows, the discounted value of cash flows. It's what money is today or in the future. Well, how does that in, in return to where do we get the capital? What is the present value of investments? of introducing or trying to borrow money in the market, of issuing stock in the market. Investors want those investments to pay them off and that's why they're gonna lend you the money in bonds. That's why they're gonna buy your stock because they want their present value to be greater in the future. How do you, how do you attract that kind of money? Well, you have a reputation through your financial results, through your financial statements, you have a represent, representation in the market and the industry of in the past providing return to your investors, providing those returns of present value into future value over time. That's important. The key source of capital for corporations is bonds, the bond market. It's not bank lending because of the restrictions of capital reserves and the, and the FDIC, banks cannot lend out vast amounts of money to individual corporations. They can lend them money, give them credit lines, lend them hundreds, lend them millions of dollars, but because of the restrictions on their operations, they can't go out and, and lend banks, uh, companies, hundreds of millions of dollars. That's where the bond market comes in. Sole proprietorships, partnerships cannot go out in the bond market and borrow money. They do all their financing through banks. But corporations use the bond market because it gives them access to huge amounts of capital by issuing bonds to the marketplace. Remember, a bond is a liability. It's a promise to pay in the future. And in the meantime, you pay interest on that bond today 
or every six months or once a year. It's called a coupon rate. A bond is the main source of funding for most American corporations. The cost of debt. Notice at the bottom of this chart. What is our cost of debt? It's the interest rates in the market based on our credit rating. It's the risk aversion in the market. Do you want to lend money to this company? Do they kind of, they don't feel like they really know what they're doing? There's some risk aversion there. What is the mix in the company of their debt and equity position? Are they highly leveraged already? Do they have a lot of debt already? That influences the cost of debt. And what is the firm's business risk? Are they in a new industry? Or are they in an industry that's getting old? Or are they in an industry that's highly regulated? Or are they in an industry that there's a lot of risk in competition and in product efficiency? That determines the cost of debt. As you can see, it gets a little complicated. It's not only having a great credit rating, it's the market, it's the industry, it's your past that drives the cost of debt, in the, especially in the bond market. Investors want to feel comfortable lending you money. Remember, bonds are issued in lots of $1,000. If you want to lend money to a corporation, you have to come up with $1,000. And then they promise to pay you that $1,000 back at a maturity date usually quite a few years down the line. But in the meantime, they will pay you an annual or a semi-annual coupon interest on that debt money. That's your return on investment. And how that interest is determined is by these market interest rates, risk aversion, the firm's history of debt and equity management, and the firm's history of managing their business. That with influences the bond market that we all are in. And all of you are in the bond market. Most of you are in the bond market in the form of United States Treasuries. And we'll take a look at that, about that a little bit later. The key features of a bond. The par value is the face amount. We use, it's in $1,000. You can't buy a bond for $500. Now, you can buy into a bond fund for as little as a buck, but you individually cannot buy a bond unless you pay $1,000. There's a coupon interest rate, which is a stated interest rate on that bond, bond obligation, but gives you the money over time. The maturity of a bond is over a period of time. Most corporate bonds are issued in 10 to 20 year maturities. Why? Because they're taking that money and they're investing in assets that are gonna create a return over time. So they need some time to get that money returned to their investors. Naturally, bonds can go in default when a risk, when the, when the issuer can't make payment. As a bond purchaser, you have to be aware of the default risk. And that's usually determined by the credit rating of a company. Remember the credit ratings are determined by Moody's Investor Service, Standard & Poor's 500, Fitch are the three leading credit agencies of corporations. Key definitions of bonds, the current yield, the capital gains yield, the expected total return. Key definitions of bonds. One of the things that you have to watch out for when bonds are being issued and a company has a lot of debt is naturally bankruptcy. There are two main, two main chapters of the Federal Bankruptcy Act, Chapter 11 and Chapter 7. It's a little bit different for individuals, but it's, it's just different chapters. But Chapter 11 is giving you the ability to reorganize your company if you declare bankruptcy. Remember, bankruptcy is like a timeout a timeout where the court tells your creditors, relax, give this time company some time to reorganize, to fix it, and you'll get your money. Chapter seven though is time's out. It's time to liquidate the company, sell off the assets, and pay off whatever you can to the creditors. Most companies naturally choose chapter 11. It gives them a chance to reorganize and fix things.
If a company goes into foreclosure or stops paying their bills or stop making interest payments or stop paying their liabilities, they file a plan with a corporate bankruptcy court. There's a court bankruptcy court in downtown Los Angeles. There's one in Riverside and there's one in San Diego. And those courts take filings by companies and gives them basically three months, excuse me, four months to reorganize, to fix it. Then they come back to the court with a plan. The court can accept it or say, no, go back to the drawing board, fix it. Management usually wants to stay in control, but usually to come out of bankruptcy, somebody's going to get fired because it was management that got them into this pickle. So usually the reorganization plan calls for some reorganization into the management structure, structure of a company. If the judge is not happy, the bankruptcy judge is not happy with their reorganization plan, the judge has the right to order liquidation, saying this ain't gonna work. Sell off your assets and pay off what you can. You read about this every day in the newspaper. If a company is liquidated, who gets paid first? Who gets paid first? Notice at the very top of the list, the tax man gets paid first. Notice what's at the very bottom of the list, the stockholders, the common and preferred stockholders. They get paid last, the equity holders. People who own or hold obligations of the company get paid first. Secured creditors, secured assets, in other words, people who have lent you money with securities or assets allocated for their protection should they go in default. Wages, unpaid contributions, retirement plans. All this, this is the how companies pay off once they are liquidated. Many times by it gets, by it gets down to the unsecured creditors, which is basically accounts payable, there's not much money left. But that's how it works. As it says here, in a liquidation, unsecured creditors generally get zero. That's, my, that's why you want to encourage companies to reorganize and not liquidate. Because if you are a creditor, like an accounts payable person, if you are a stockholder, you're not gonna get anything out of this liquidation. So you usually encourage them to reorganize and come up with a plan at least to get some of your money back in reorganization. I've been involved in bankruptcy as being owed money. And yes, uh, if a company in on both sides of the coin, if a company reorganized, I usually got back 30 to 40 cents on my dollar of what I lent them. If they go in liquidation, I usually got nothing. So you, you encourage reorganization in bankruptcy. Debt causes default. Debt is an obligation. Equity or stock, you're an owner. You're an owner. And stock is the major form of investment for investors in America, stockholders. And you'll be examining some of this in your <clears throat> discussion post this week. You're gonna be determining and selecting stocks for a portfolio. How will they change in price over the course of the next 10 weeks? That's gonna tell us a little bit about the markets. There's two types of stock, common stock and preferred stock. Common stock is stock that is, you have a vote in the company. There's no guaranteed dividend, but there usually are. They usually pay dividends because they wanna keep you as a stockholder. You have a say in running the business as a common stockholder. You pick the board of directors. The board of directors pick the management team. The management team runs the company. Preferred stock, on the other hand, you have no vote or say in the company. No say in the management or the board. But the attractiveness of preferred stock is you get a guaranteed dividend every year. Common stock, no guarantees. Preferred stock, guarantees. Naturally, preferred stock doesn't change in price very often. Why? Because the main reason people buy preferred stock is for the dividend. 
they're not in it for the growth. They're in it for the dividend, the, re, the cash flow. So many companies don't issue preferred stocks because it's cash flow. It locks them in to fixed payments. A lot of companies want to stay away from that. Just like bonds, stocks have determined the value of a company. It's determining from the free cash flow how much money you have to pay dividends. If you have a lot of free cash flow, you'll pay dividends to shareholders. And that those dividends go towards what the investor requires as their return on stock. If you this morning go on Robinhood, or if you go on uh, Charles Schwab, or E-Trade and want to buy a stock. Why are you buying stock? You want to buy stock because you anticipate that you want to make some money off of that stock. How do you make money off a of stock? The company's performance. If the company performs well, makes profits, they'll distribute some of those profits to you in income, dividends. At the same time, because they're doing well with profits and growth, more investors will want to own the stock, thus forcing the price of the stock up in the market, supply and demand. The more company, the better a company does, the more valuable they are in the market because more people want to own it. Anybody ever hear of Amazon, Apple, even Tesla? Their prices have gone up over the last couple of years because the demand for the stock has gone up. In the case of Tesla, they haven't been making any money, but they're in an industry and a field where there's growth potential. So people want to get in on it. So stock like bonds is based on anticipated return in the future. How you expect the dividend to grow over time? How do you expect the average rate of return to grow over time on the value of the stock? That's a key in stock investment. And that's a key why companies issue stock in the marketplace. They get capital from the market where they can use to invest in growth, assets, people, R&D, and develop new products. In return, they have to make sure that those profits make the stock grow in price and you pay a dividend to those investors. That's the required return on the stock. There's a way of calculating that that we'll talk about next week. Common stock represents ownership. You are an owner of the company. You through proxy voting elect board directors. The directors hire management. Management hires the managers and the representatives who run the company. All these people put together and manage the company to maximize the value of the company. That's what the corporate finance office does to make sure that the company is gaining value for their investors. Who are the investors? The bondholders, the bank investors, the bank lenders, the stockholders. It's all about them. Naturally, you, you run the company to hire management and to hire personnel that brings value to the company. That's why so many people in management positions with corporations make a, a big salary because they can maximize the value of the company, not only through their efforts in the work in the workplace, but also acquiring more talent to run the business. There's different ways of looking at stock. It's talked about this in the textbook. It's the free cash flow model where you can determine the value of a stock by looking at its potential growth over time of free cash flow. Or it's the dividend growth model, what the company feels it can grow at in dividends into the future. Present value of those amounts back to today, you can determine its intrinsic or present value. Why is that important? Because again, I'm going to invest in Apple because I think the company is going to increase at 8% a year. But if they don't increase at 8% a year, I'm probably going to sell the stock because it's not giving me my required rate of return. Management of a company 
needs to understand that 8%. That means the company has to invest in assets and generate a return on those assets greater than or at least at 8% to cover those costs and those demands of their investors. That's what puts pressure on the corporate finance people. What's the expectation of the investors in the market? You know the expectations of the bondholders, that's a given. A bond is issued at a given coupon rate and a given maturity date. Management knows exactly when they have to pay that back and how much. But in the form of stock, it's a little bit different. It's based on the current market conditions today, in the future. And those change all the time. And you know that, especially if any of you have dealt with the pandemic on a business level. The pandemic threw this all into a loop. Nobody knows what the future is going to be. Now it looks a little bit different because the pandemic is winding down, hopefully. But a year ago, nobody had a clue what was going to happen. And it was really scary. Thus, companies laid off people. They couldn't anticipate what growth was going to be because there was no growth. They scaled back. They waited to see what would happen. Now, a year, year and a half later, Vaccinations are growing. People are getting out, spending money, buying products and services. Companies are beginning to get going again. Stock prices continue to rise because of that. The future is positive. That's important concept in corporate finance. Remember the two key terms, we're going to talk about this a lot over the next couple of weeks, it's also next week, is free cash flow and weighted average cost of capital. The cash that's available to the investors of the company. I'm not going to invest in a company that has negative free cash flow. That means I'm not going to get any dividends. It means the company's not growing. I want to generate and invest in a company that's providing free cash flow so I know I'm going to get a return on my investment. And I want to invest in a company where money and the cost of the money that they're getting is cheap. Cheap. Because that means if money is cheap, their value is greater because it's less of a discount on those assets of the company. That's why for the last 15, 20 years, the government through their monetary policies, the Federal Reserve and the Treasury Department and the White House have demanded cheap capital in the marketplace. Keeping money cheap encourages investments. Keeping money cheap makes companies acquire and have lower costs, thus they're gonna make more profits. More profits they can distribute to their shareholders, investors, and makes the economy grow. That's been the philosophy of our economy in the last 15, 20 years. Remember the value of a company's operations. How much is a company worth is the sum of their future cash flows discounted at their weighted average cost of capital. That's the value of a company. So let's say I have a free cash flow of $100,000 this year and my cost of capital is 10%. My weighted average cost of capital is 10%. $100,000 divided by 10% is $1 million. That's, that's a little simple terms, but that's what it is. My company has a value of $1 million. I'm generating $100,000 a year in free cash flow at a cost of capital of 10%, that means I'm generating a value of $1 million. Now that's a very simplistic look at that, but it gets, uh, that's generally what it, what it is. The company is generating growth, but here it gets a little bit more complicated when it goes out over a period of time, usually five to 10 years. After, after 10 years, it's a little bit difficult to predict how a company is going to do but the free cash flow is the sum of those years. And then you discount those sums back at your cost of capital to determine the value or the value of this company. That's an important calculation. 
Another important calculation is what is, how can we determine the present value or the current value of stock if we know the dividend growth model? And it's it basically, it's what is our dividend going to be in the future, dividing it by what we expect to return on our investment minus the growth rate that a company anticipates doing. Now, let me explain that. Every public corporation in America, every quarter has to give their 12 month plan for profits and growth. Every quarter, they have conference calls. They put out information to the market. It's required by law, Security Exchange Commission of the government watches this, that every public corporation has to say what they anticipate their company to be going to be doing in the next year. Every quarter, they modify that for the next 12 months and the next 12 months. And it gives the market, it gives investors an idea that, hmm, this company says they're going to be making some good money. This is what they expect to grow, grow at. This is what I expect to earn. Is this a good investment for me? Remember, some of us in the market have low expectations of return. Some of us have high expectations of return and we'll talk about this next week, it's called risk and return, chapter six. In other words, if I'm 25 years old, I'm, I have a little bit more potential for risk aversion because I'm young. All right, I'm willing to get into some investments that may not be very reliable as far as giving me my return because they're risky. So I'm willing to make those investments because I got a long time left to do work and generate income. But if I'm 55 years old, my risk aversion is rather limited. Why would I want to invest in something today into the future where I'm going to be retired in 10 years? I want low risk investments. So my rate of return or expectations of return is going to be lower because I'm looking for safety and security. So every company has to gauge their sources of outside market capital based on what type of investors are out there these days. Younger investors can, go, can, can live with higher risk, but they will want higher return in reward for that. Older investors want minimal risk, so they're not expecting much return. This is why the finance people at companies get paid a lot of money. They have to gauge how their company fits in to these risk strategies of their investors and the market. It's quite something. So don't sell your stockbrokers too short. They're in an industry where you have many companies seeking capital with investors with different tastes and desires as far as return and security. And we'll talk about that a little bit next week. As I said earlier, the present value of stock is the accumulation of return over time discounted at your expect expectations of return. My dividend is going to grow at X amount of rate over the into the future. And my discount rate is, oh, I expect to make a certain amount of dollars off that into the future. Our review problems look at these examples this week if you want to take a look at them. But again, in this class, I'm not going to be giving you case studies on analyzing and determining stock price. You've already done that in business finance, hopefully. But I need you to understand these concept, concepts because when we do get to case study number one, you're going to have to look at the risk and return as an investor, as a manager of a company in attracting capital in the marketplace. Your credit rating will determine your risk in the marketplace. Your beta and we'll talk about that next week. So understanding these concepts of determining the present value of, of a company is to determine the future potential return of return to the investor discounted at the investor's expectations for return. Makes your head spin, doesn't it? What is that required rate of return? How do, how do I know what my required rate of return is? Well, it's in rate of return in relationship to the market and the risk in the market. Notice in this calculation, the rate of return is 13%, expected rate of return. 
That's the rate of return in the market. What's the market? Risk-free, zero risk at 7%. Market premium, RPM. That's the difference between the market rate of return and the risk-free rate. That's the spread of 5%. What's the risk in the market of this company? It's beta, 1.2. Combine all those, the investor of this company in this market would like a 13% rate of return on this investment. This is called the capital asset pricing model. And again, we'll talk about this next week. But this is what drives investors to get into the market. How much they anticipate in getting a return of this magnitude. And what's the risk to get that return? That's why people buy stock. If you don't want to bother with all this, buy a bond. Buy a bond and you know when you're going to get paid. You know when you're going to get your interest payments. You know when you're going to get your money back at maturity. No questions asked. You know it. But in stock, it's all expectations of what you think you can get at the risk and the return in the market. We'll talk more about that next week. Jump through this. Preferred stock. Remember I said earlier, preferred stock is a stock with a guaranteed dividend. It's called a hybrid security. It's a combination of bonds and common stock. It's right in between. Why is it like a bond? You know exactly what you're getting paid. In this case, it's a fixed dividend. Why is it like a stock? You're an owner of the company. But you have no say in the operations of the business. So it's an interesting entity. Companies that are highly regulated, like Southern California Edison, like the gas company, like the water company, they're highly regulated. Why? Because those are services provided to all people. Everybody needs electricity, natural gas water. So the government regulates those industry to price them in a market that allows everybody to have access to those products. Ford Motor Company and Apple Computer are not regulated. If you want to buy a Ford, you want to buy an Apple, you pay the price that they want to give you because they need to make their profits. It's a little bit different in regulated industries because they have to make sure the general public receives those services. You don't regulate Ford because everybody doesn't want to drive a Ford. So because of those regulations, they're limited by how much money they can make profit. Thus, they go to the equity markets, issue preferred stock, because there they can include those dividends as a fixed cost of the company, and they will be regulated just like their other costs of running their business. Interesting. The value of preferred stock is very similar. The expected dividend, which is always constant, divided by the expected return. In this case, if I anticipate a company pays me $2.10 a year in a preferred stock dividend, I anticipate a 7% return in the market of this stock every year. What should the value of the stock be? $30. $2.10 divided by 7% is 30 bucks. That's what the stock should be in order for me to get my dividend and my return. This all leads us to strategic issues. And that's what this class is all about. Yes, it's important to understand the definitions and the calculations, but you've done that before. It's how do we apply these to the situation of management? Many of you are taking this course because someday you might want to be an owner and an entrepreneur of a, of a business. Well, how do you go out and finding capital? How do you appeal to bank, banks to lend you money? How do you appeal to private investors t- to issue you equity? In order to do that, you have to understand where you are and what is money in the marketplace. I'm retired now, no longer 
working day to day. I teach, which I enjoy, but I take taking it easy because I worked for 40 years in the investment banking industry. But there's still a couple of things I do every morning. Make my wife her coffee, let out the cat. Her name is Bader. Get the newspapers. And speaking of newspapers, Wall Street Journal. Might want to think about reading this if you're not already doing so. The Wall Street Journal, a wonderful newspaper to find out what's going on in the business world. If any of you are interested in the Wall Street Journal, I can get a student discount for you very cheaply while you're a student at the University of Laverne. So give me a shout out and I'll hook you up. If you want to get one without a student, uh, it's very expensive. It's about $500 a year. Very expensive newspaper. But I have been reading the Wall Street Journal for four, over 40 years. And without that, I wouldn't have done a lot of things in my business career without it. But after I get the newspapers in the morning, I go to CNBC. I go to the Wall Street Journal. And I look at these nine indicators you see on your screen. Indicators of the equity markets, the debt markets or credit markets, the commodity markets, and the currency markets. These tell me what's going on in the world around me. These were the indicator prices in 2019 and 2020. And here they are currently as of Tuesday of this week. The Dow Jones Industrial Index, the Standard & Poor's 500, the NASDAQ Index are the leading equity indicators in the economy. Dow Jones is the top 30 companies as determined by the Wall Street Journal. Standard & Poor's 500 is the top 500 companies by industry, according to a company called Standard & Poor's, which is the leading credit agency of corporations. NASDAQ is the leading small and mid-sized index of companies in America, even though Apple and Amazon are a part of NASDAQ. NASDAQ is an exchange over-the-counter digital trading exchange. These three indexes, and you remember indexes from your statistics studies years ago, indexes combine groups of numbers into one index to track. Notice the Dow has done very well, 2019, 20, and currently it's gone up. Equity markets have done well. That's the, been the growth in the investment world. The next area is the 10-year United States Treasury yield. Look at that, how that has gone up since December. Interest rates are rising. This is called the risk-free interest rate. In other words, there's no risk in lending $1,000 for 10 years to the United States government. You're gonna get your money. In other words, if you would have, if you would have, if you would lend Rick Hassey $1,000 for 10 years, you would probably demand about three, 4% interest. It's risky. Who's Rick Hassey? I don't know if I'm gonna get my money back. He's my professor, but what else is new? But the United States government is going to pay you your money back. That's the current risk-free interest rate, 1.57% as of earlier this week. So if I lend the United States government $1,000 and get paid back in 10 years, I'll get roughly 16 bucks a year in interest. Wow, isn't that exciting? No risk, I can sleep at night. That's why it's called the risk-free interest rate. This rate sets the rate for mortgages, sets the rate for car loans, sets the rate for credit cards, sets the rate for all different types of credit and lending, the United States Treasury yield. The next two are the leading commodities in the market, oil and gold. Oil has been cheap the last year or so. Notice going back, 
$61, 2019, 2020, 48 bucks. Now it's back past 2019 prices, $69. Gold, oil is determined by supply and demand, the demand for oil. Demand for oil in the last year or so has weakened. Solar energy, battery powered automobiles. Oil is not as in demand as it used to be. So the oil producing nations, which are basically United States and the Middle East countries, have now begun to cut back on supply to keep those prices high. Anybody buy gasoline lately? Oof. It's going up because supply is being cut back. When there's less supply and more demand, prices increase. And that's a determining factor of the industry of the market because everybody uses oil related products. Gold is a hedge fund. Gold is a hedge. If you think things are not going well, buy gold. Gold is a stability investment. Gold is where you have no other place to go, you buy gold. Those are key commodities. And then the three leading currencies of the world trading markets, the Euro, the Chinese yuan, and the Japanese yen and their relationship to the United States dollar. This is what drives strategic strategies for corporations in the capital markets. There's a lot of other indicators as well, but these are the nine biggies. Equity markets, credit markets, commodity markets, currency markets. Be good to understand these and track them. You don't have to. But if you coming out of college with an MBA degree and you go into an interview at a corporation looking for a manager, a VP, a supervisor, and you have no clue of what's going on in the industry or the world that has to do with this company, they're not gonna hire you. You need to be aware of what's going on outside of individual companies. The Franklin, the $100 bill. If you notice, the United States dollar has remained pretty stable and valuable over these last few years. Why? Because the United States dollar is backed up by the strongest economy in the world. Why? The United States dollar is backed up by, of course, this is debatable these days, depending on who you ask, by the, by the best and most reliable political environment in the world democracy. Why? Because the United States of America is the world's policeman. You're in trouble. You need help. Usually the United States is there to help you in some shape or form with aid, with military aid, with protection. We're the world's policeman. Like it or not, we are. Why? because the culture of America is everywhere. You can be in Moscow, you can be in Singapore, you can be in Australia, you can be in the Fiji Islands, and I bet you somebody there knows who Taylor Swift is, who knows Arnold Schwarzenegger, who knows the Beach Boys, who knows McDonald's hamburgers. The American culture is everywhere. Because the American culture is everywhere, that makes our dollar very valuable. So this is the environment that Americans, American corporations are running their businesses. Lots of competition, Chinese, India, South America, Europe, the Middle East, Asia. But our dollar is secure and strong because of our economy, because of our political system, because of our social system, and because of our reputation around the world. Now it's taken a hit these last few years in a variety of ways. Donald Trump, management of our borders, the growth of the Chinese economy and competition, 
but it still remains very strong. And going forward, if I was a manager of a company, I sat on the board of a company, I was a VP or a CEO of a company, part of my business is understanding what is our reputation in the world for our products, our government, the way we do business. That's important. And that's something we have to consider as a strategic item in our discussions in this class. Because we have competition. That's why you guys are going and getting your MBA degree. Because with that MBA degree, you'll be able to compete in the marketplace for jobs and responsibilities that warrant your education and your training. That's why you're doing this. You're enhancing your return on your money. And that's important. Because there's people in China, there's people in Europe that are all about competing for that, that market, for those services, for those products. And you have to develop your career to compete in those markets. That's why you're getting an MBA degree. And if you think you're not getting your MBA degree for that, you're wrong. You're putting yourself in a position to compete and be a leader. And because of that, the company is going to pay you a good salary because you're going to add value to the company or you're going to be creating a company as an entrepreneur to create value for your business idea and model. That's why you're doing that. So that's our opening lecture for this week one, kind of an overview, an overview of the basics of capital valuation, stocks and bonds, an overview of the time value of money, an overview of the general definition of finance and how we use it going forward. Next week, we have a topic of risk and return. The week after, we look at financial statement analysis. How do we take this information and analyze it and plan into the future? From that, we develop strategic goals of investments and return on investments, which is our week four topic and five. We're developing strategic ideas based on the world, the information around us in our own company situations. That's what we're studying. Your job as a student, if you don't understand the present value of money, you got to get to understand it. You don't understand the definition of stocks and bonds, you better understand it. You don't understand what I mean by discounted cash flow, you better understand it. Because we're going to be using all these concepts in developing strategic analysis and models going forward in this class. Remember, our class is a, a synchronous class, meaning it's online study. No classroom, no, no mandatory class sessions. Your job as a student is to gather this information and be prepared to interpret it, to analyze it, to explain it. And that's the nature of our study. And you begin to do, begin to do that this week. One of the first assessments of this course is to determine and be able to post to uh, the Blackboard environment and give me a, a sample of your writing capabilities and explain yourself in a biography. Tell me about yourself. This is posted to a discussion forum so all your colleagues in this class can read it. Tell us about yourself, why you chose Laverne. What do you do for a living? You don't have to be, get into specifics, but tell me about yourself. I wanna see how you do that, how you write. And part two is, how analytical are you? How can you do research? If any of you have had me prior to this, we've done this in the business finance class, undergraduate. I'm giving you $100,000. And with that $100,000, you can pick up to five stocks in a portfolio. And you're gonna watch those stocks and do some analyt analytical work on that portfolio over the course of our 10 week term. You can pick just one stock, invest a whole 100,000, or you can pick two, three, four, and five, no more than five. 
And these stocks have to be traded in the American exchanges of New York's and NASDAQ exchanges. You're gonna price your portfolio as of this Friday, June 11th. Remember the United States stock markets open Pacific time at 6.30 in the morning and close at 1 p.m. in the afternoon. That's the trading day. So at the end of that trading day on Friday, you will price your portfolio of your stocks. Once you select your stocks on Friday, you can't change. You're locked into that portfolio for the entire 10 weeks. And then we're gonna see how that portfolio changes. Why does it change? The spreadsheet has to be in Excel, Apple numbers, Google Sheets, but you have to post and attach a spreadsheet to this discussion forum so I can download your portfolio and help and also track it during the course of our course. Here's what your here's a sample portfolio that I provided right here. Here's what it looks like. So here's my portfolio for this summer term. Apple Computer, GameStop, <laughs> Viva Systems, and Clean Harbors. There's their ticker symbol. That's the symbol they get on the stock exchanges. Those are the exchanges that those stocks are traded at. And you're gonna date it for Friday, June 11th. And on Friday, June 11th, you're going to get the closing price on Friday and that will be your price that you will put in your spreadsheet. Then you will determine how much you will determine of allocation. It doesn't have to be four stocks at $25,000, it can be, one stock at 100, it can be two stocks at 25 and 75. You determine the dollar makeup. Once you determine that in your spreadsheet, you are to take the closing price and divide it into the investment to get the amount of shares you are purchasing. So that's why I require a spreadsheet, spreadsheet so I can see this formula in that cell. That's why I'm giving you the PDF file, because I want to see you do the spreadsheet and the calculations. And you are going to round this share amount to the nearest whole number. Because this, if you actually take 338.80 and divide it into 25,000, it becomes a decimal. I want you to round to the nearest whole dollar. Because then as we go forward in this course, you're going to take as the prices go up and down, at every valuation period, and I will designate which what those periods are, you're gonna multiply that price times the original share amount that you bought to get your new valued valuation amount. And then you're gonna compare that to the Dow, the S&P 500, and the NASDAQ indexes. So you have to have, also have to find those prices at the close of business. Friday, June 11th, because we're going to track those also. So we're going to compare how our portfolio does to the market indexes and portfolios. Find the price, determine the amount of dollar investment, divide the price into the investment to determine the number of shares. Then give me a brief explanation of why you selected those stocks. And many of you have already posted your explanations in your discussion board, which is good. Now all I have to do is get the prices on Friday and post your spreadsheet and we're off to the races. Because what we're going to be doing in a couple of weeks, we're gonna be selecting one or two of the companies from your portfolios and do some financial statement analysis about those companies. Later on in the term, we're gonna be doing a capital structure and a review of the company's financial structure in our class. So a lot of different things we're gonna be doing with this portfolio and also it gives you an opportunity to understand the financial markets. So that's your task for this week, to attach your spreadsheet to your discussion forum, to give me an explanation on why you pick those companies in your portfolio and give me a little brief bio about yourself so we can get to know you. 
That's your assigned work this week. That's part of your class participation grade. This work this week is 5% of your course grade. And finally, what I'm going to be doing at the end of this week on Friday is posting a proposed schedule of times and dates for you to select to meet me via Zoom individually over the next couple of weeks. I find this very important for online studies is for the professor, me, and you individually get together and just make sure you're comfortable with the course you your technology, your, the way you're learning the course at home is, is suitable for you. If you need any help in that regard, can I make things a little bit more clear for you in context of the course and our, our plan? Just to, and also just to get to know you. So at the end of the week, I'll be posting a schedule and you select a date and a time going over into the next couple of weeks and you will get to meet with me individually. This is a graded assessment. If you blow this off, you get a zero. That doesn't help your grade much any. So everybody has to do this. Sorry for those people who wanna hide in the world of internet. And I don't blame you, uh, but you have to do this. You have to meet with me individually. And it's also get, good to get to know your professor and feel comfortable with your professor and understand that your professor is here to help you achieve everything you wanted to achieve out of this MBA program. So that's it for this week one. Remember, we do it all again next week and week two. On the weekend, I will publish an introduction video for the week. Then on Monday or Tuesday of next week, I will produce produce another video highlighting our topics for the week. Uh, the only graded work we have in week two is to attend your professor meetings. Our first casework is not until week three, due on June 27th. So if you have any questions or concerns, remember you can post to the discussion forum and post questions here and ask me and I can get back to you. Everybody uh, has that ability to do that, you can send me an email. But if you send me an email, please indicate on the email what class you are in. I'm teaching, remember, two sections of 630 this summer. The 630 class is meeting tonight, Wednesday night, from 6 to 9 o'clock. And again, remember I mentioned that you're more than welcome to sit in on those classes and uh, see my lectures, but basically you're going to hear exactly what you just heard on this video at the 6.30 in class tonight. So just to indicate in any emails you send me, HASI or 6.30 online, just say 6.30 online and I'll know what class you're in. Because as we go forward in this class, you're gonna be doing things a little bit differently than the 6.30 that meets on Wednesday night. So I look forward to working with you all. I hope I've answered some of your questions as we get started. If there's still some open item questions you have, let me know. I'm online and available at all hours of the day through every day of the week this summer. I'm not going anywhere. The only thing, the only place you can't cannot locate me is on Tuesday mornings and Friday mornings. I'm playing golf. And I'll still have my phone with me but you better not bother me then. All right, everybody. Hope this gets us off to a good start. And we'll, I look forward to working with you all. <laughs> Excuse me. Good Lord, Mr. Hassey. That's a nice way to end it. Excuse me. Have a great rest of the week and we'll see you online. Adios, everybody. <laughs>